So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is James. Um, I work for HP as an OpenStack developer. Um, before starting at HP six months ago, I've been a sysadmin for 14-ish years. Um, so if I seem nervous this afternoon, it's because I, it's my first stint as a developer. It's my first time on this side of the speaker's podium. And also because I'm here to tell you about Triple O. And the one person who knows more than anyone else in the world is in the audience listening to me. That's Rob Collins, the tech lead. <sighs> so I first heard the name uh, Triple O probably about 18 months ago when Rob was telling me about the new project he was working on at HP. And being an internet savvy person, I thought I'd go on the internet to find out what Triple O was. So I did a quick search on a popular internet search engine, and the results were not all that useful. Um, apparently this Triple O journal has been around for a couple of decades. Um, it's picked up a fourth O along the way and an E. Um, it's still called Triple O, as you can see from the URL, but I'm pretty sure that's not what Rob has been working on. So since the internet had failed me, I turned to friends and family. I asked them about Triple O. And um, I know some of you are traveling here from overseas, and you've just discovered that Australia has just stopped using signatures on credit cards, and that's causing hassles for you. Well, if you do get into a real emergency, you'll need to know a different kind of Triple O. Um, this is what you'll use from a landline over here. But I'm also pretty sure that that's not what Rob was working on either. So what actually is Triple O? Um, more recently found out that Triple O is an OpenStack program, not a project. And all of the OpenStack programs have a mission statement in this particular YAML file. And I'm sure you're going to memorize this and go look at it later. Um, to save you a bit of time, though, here's Triple O's mission statement. Triple O's mission is to develop and maintain tooling and infrastructure able to deploy OpenStack in production using OpenStack itself wherever possible. Um, Angus from Rackspace was talking earlier about Solem, which is a tool that does deployments. Um, but he mentioned that it can't deploy Triple O. Uh, can't deploy OpenStack. Um, but the goal of Triple O is actually to produce something that can deploy OpenStack. The key, though, is that we're using OpenStack itself whenever possible. Why, why are we doing this? Um, why? Think about the situation before Triple O. You have yourself a shiny new data center. You've got thousands of you know, nice shiny new machines from HP or some other provider. You've, um, you've got lots of customers who want this cloud thing that they've heard about that you've promised you can deliver to them. You need somehow to get these blank machines to a state where it's delivering a cloud. So you start by sending your sysadmins off to some training on how to use Cobbler or some other tool so that they can install an OS on all the machines. Then once you've done that, you realize you need to configure services. So you send them off to do some training on Puppet or Chef or some other config management tool. Then you realize that it's not enough just to be able to configure a web server on this machine and a database server on that machine. You want to be able to tie them, to orchestrate them together. You want to be able to roll out one application that needs some storage over here and some database over there and some web servers and a proxy. You need it working, linking them all together. It's not enough just to manage the configs on one machine. You have to be able to orchestrate the deployment across your whole data center to get all of the different things you need in the right places, in the right amounts, linked together. So you learn some other tooling. Maybe you write some code yourself. Um, and eventually, you have that sorted out as well. Then you have a cloud, which you can sell to your customers. And what does this cloud do? It will have some kind of config management. It will have some kind of orchestration so that you can deploy an application that has databases and web servers and proxies it will hook up networking between all of them. In short, it does a lot of the stuff you've just spent a lot of time and effort learning how to do for you. So why did you learn one set of tools in order to be able to deploy another set of tools to do the same job? 
So the theory behind triple O is you should only need to learn one set of tools to do that job. And you should be able to do that job multiple times. <sighs> so if you've ever heard about triple O before, you are probably aware that we use a couple of different clouds to do different parts of this work. In order to get from a blank data center with nothing in it, um, you're probably familiar with rocketry. If you've played Kerbal Space Program, or if you've you know, seen any actual rockets on TV, um, rockets have a similar issue if they're trying to get off the planet into space. It's a really big job. You can't have one single stage that gets you the whole way there. So rockets have big, beefy, heavy lifters on the bottom, which then get discarded. And you have much smaller, agile engines to get you the rest of the way. With Triple O, we have a reverse approach. You've got nothing to start with. So we start with a very, very tiny seed. This seed is a single pre-built virtual machine. And I'll talk a bit more about how we actually build that virtual machine later on. Um, the seed has a very minimal pre-configured number of OpenStack services. So we have Glance for being able to serve disk images. We have Neutron or Nova networking to be able to set up some networking. A few other OpenStack services, but this is very small, very self-contained. Um, the idea is you can walk into a data center with this on a USB stick and boot it onto your first machine, or you can walk in with a laptop and run it from there. But it's also very focused. All the seed has to do is deploy the deploy cloud. Until recently, we referred to this as an undercloud. Um, if I slip up later on in the program, I'm probably going to mention it as an undercloud. And if you look at our documentation, we still mostly refer to it as an undercloud. Um, so the deploy cloud, and this is where Rob is probably going to correct me, if he's going to correct me anywhere. The deploy cloud is a bit bigger than the seed. It might be, say, three, via, uh, three physical machines, if you want some high availability, which most people seem to care about. It has a few more services than the seed does, um, but again, all OpenStack services. The main job of this deploy cloud is it's the thing that your sysadmins access. It's a thing that takes ownership of all the machines, all the rest of the machines in your data center. And it then enables you to do the rest of the deployment, hence deploy cloud. Um, a big factor in this is a tool called Ironic, which provides a Nova driver. And thus, you can use the standard Nova APIs to treat physical bare metal machines in much the same way you would treat a virtual machine. It doesn't have the full Nova spec. It uh, doesn't allow you to do everything you would do with a virtual machine, because it is physical hardware. So if you want to change a network cable, you need someone to actually go and do that. Um, if you need someone to change networking, for instance, you might need to actually go and reconfigure a switch. But it does allow us to deploy disk images to a physical machine. It does allow us to turn it on and off again using the out-of-band management tools. Um, so that's enough that we can start using the deploy cloud to manage all the rest of the stuff in the data center. So then using the deploy cloud, we're able to deploy a workload cloud, and again, this used to be called an overcloud. Um, this, is, this is the cloud. This is the thing that your customers want to access. Um, this is you know, what anyone thinks of when they think of the cloud. Please note that this doesn't mean that we're doing nested virtualization here. There's no VMs running inside VMs at this point. Um, the workload cloud is you know, VMs deployed on hardware. We're just using the cloud terminology because that's, we're using the same tools to manage it the same way. But the deploy cloud is talking to physical hardware. Um, so why do we do it this way? Well, originally it came about, as I understand it, this is 
from before my time with Triple uh, O. Because Nova wasn't particularly happy at the time handling different kinds of hypervisors. So it was very difficult to have the same Nova instance managing virtual machines and physical machines. Um, I'm told that that's been fixed. But along the way, we discovered other benefits. Um, so a lot of people like the security separation here. Your sysadmins are accessing the, the deploy cloud over here, while your users access the workload cloud. Um, so even if the, work, the users get some elevated privileges in the workload cloud, they're still not accessing all the rest of the machines around your data center. Also, for people who do continuous deployments of their workload cloud, this means you can have one single deploy cloud, and from that deploy cloud, you can rapidly build out a new workload cloud. So it gives you a way to rapidly test and iterate your workload cloud. Um, if you can combine that with a way to move workloads between different iterations of the workload cloud and you know, contract the old one while you expand the new one, this gives you a nice, clean way to migrate stuff between versions of the workload cloud. And also, it makes cold restarts of your data center easy. Um, your cloud requires a lot of services to be up and running to bring up the cloud. So that can be tricky if everything has just shut down and you need to know which order to bring things up in. Having these stages gives you a nice defined way um, to come up from nothing and get everything back up. So what tools do we have in Triple O? Um, in general, we take a fairly Unix-like philosophy. Um, our tools are small pieces. They're mostly fairly narrow focus tools, mostly written in Python. And they're loosely joined. Um, we have larger Python tools which aggregate lots of the smaller tools. And on top of the whole thing, we have some shell scripts to tie it all together. So some of the tools that we've built, um, wherever possible, we try to use existing OpenStack tools. So rather than writing a new orchestration engine, we use Heat. Rather than writing a, some new thing for getting disk images onto machines, we use Glance. Rather than writing authentication stuff, we use Keystone. But there are some, some jobs that are so unique to Triple O that there is no other OpenStack tool to do them. So the biggest one of these is a tool we've called Disk Image Builder, which is a very, very boring name. Um, before I can talk about the tool, I need to talk about the way we build machines in Triple O. Um, if you're familiar with using you know, Cobbler to install the OS, then Puppet for config management, um, you're probably used to thinking of a model where you get the base OS on all your machines. Then you roll out configs, and each machine will install packages, drop config files, start services running. That works fine at a smaller scale. For some people, it works fine at a larger scale. But it's, it has a lot of, it can be very inconsistent because if you have a thousand machines, you might find that 995 of them all get the full config applied. But this one missed one package. And this one happened to have a power glitch just as it was writing a config file. And this one had a network glitch and didn't get a different package. So you end up with a mixture of machines that are at different states. Um, some are missing you know, different things. It also means that when you put a conf config through testing in your test environment, that may not quite match what rolls out in production because there might have been a new release of OpenSSL overnight. And so when the production machines have to get update the latest OpenSSL package, they're upgrading to a newer release than what you tested with. So all these little inconsistencies, all small, you can work around them. But they can lead, make it difficult to make sure that all your machines are in a consistent state. So the idea with Disk Image Builder is that we can compile a disk image ahead of time, put that image through testing, um, through your CI or CD toolchain, and then that, that exact image with those exact versions of software with everything identical is exactly what get, gets rolled out to every single node 
in your data center. You can still have issues where maybe there's a network glitch and one machine doesn't get that image. Or you can have issues where one machine power cycles and doesn't get the image. But at least you know that all the machines that got the image got exactly the same image and they're running exactly what was tested through your CI infrastructure. Um, the triple O builds also rely on a read-only root file system. Um, it's great for CI because it means that this, exactly the same image is going out to each machine. Um, I'll get back and talk a bit more about how we deal with the fact that it's fine to roll out the same image everywhere, but each machine will be unique in some way. I mean, at a minimum, they're going to have different IP addresses and different host names. So you need some way to deal with that. We'll talk about that later. Um, the, yeah, disk image builder is, at, is what we call a machine compiler. Um, Rob did a talk on it at LCA earlier this year. Um, all you have to do is memorize that URL or look at the slides later, and you can go watch that talk. So as I said, it's, it's great that you've rolled out the one image. Not one image, obviously. You're going to have different types of machine in your data center. So you're going to have web servers and database servers, and they're going to need slightly different things. Um, your database servers probably don't need Apache on it, for instance. So obviously, you would not roll out one image across your whole data center. It's, but you'd roll out a couple of different types, depending on what function the machines had. But then you need to apply unique configs to each node. Um, to do this, we have a set of tools called OS star config. Because there's a bunch of them, so it's easier just to give you a regex. A regex would be dot star config. Sorry. Um, so the first OS star config tool is OS collect config. Um, it collects config from places and compiles the config together into a single JSON blob that describes the machine. The places it collects from can be quite diverse. It can be from uh, a local file system. It can collect from a metadata service, such as Heat or the EC2 metadata service. Theoretically, you could write it to pull from a RabbitMQ service or DNS or Hira or something like that. But it pulls data in, compiles a JSON blob that describes all the config for this machine. Uh, the next tool is OS apply config, which does what the name suggests. It takes that JSON blob, uh, uses mustache to write out templated files. So this is where you read data in from the JSON config and write out your Apache config with all the values for this machine, or whatever you need to do on this machine. Um, if you're familiar with Puppet, you'll know it's fairly common that you download a package, you write out the, the config files, then you start a service. And similarly with our tools, there's a service called OS Refresh Config, um, which runs scripts to start up services or to make further modifications. OS Refresh Config usually, ideally, would just be run once whenever the config changes. In practice, I think we tend to run it semi-regularly um, because, you know, sometimes services need to be started a few times before they come up properly, things like that. Just to be confusing, we also have some other tools. Uh, we're working on one at the moment called OS Cloud Config, which is not one of these tools, even though it matches the regex. And there's another one coming soon called OS Net Config, which does some small local network stuff. These tools are not intended to be a replacement for Puppet or Chef. Um, they're very, very simple. They're intended to be tied to OpenStack and to what we're trying to do. You could use them to configure your Puppet agent or whatever Chef uses or other things. But what they're intended to be is a very minimal tool chain to get your cloud up and running. Um, this does kind of mean, though, that we've invented a tool that does some of the work that tools like Puppet do. But there's a good reason for this. Um, these tools need to be able to run while we're building the disk image. Um, so these have to run inside a Chroot, changing files on the Chroot without accessing any access to the network. 
Um, you could probably use them as a config management tool after that point, but it's not really what we think they're intended for. Um, in general, we think it's probably a better idea if you've got major changes to the machine, rather than using a config management tool to roll that out, you build a new disk image. You test that new disk image. You make sure that the new versions work with all the things you need them to do. Then you can deploy them again via your deploy cloud to the workload cloud. Um, Heat is the standard OpenStack automation, uh, orchestration tool. Um, it was mentioned by Angus earlier in his talk about Solem. It's used by Solem to do the orchestration of deploying out to the cloud. And here we use it similarly to uh, control the rollout to say, you know, I need 10 database servers and three web servers and whatever else you need. Heap, um, make sure that all the things come up in the right order, make sure that dependencies are triggered and so on. It's fairly standard. The only thing, the only unusual thing about the way we use Heat is that we're using it to deploy OpenStack. And this kind of provides a boot, uh, bootstrap issue. We need to have heat up and running in order to be able to deploy the stack. But in order to have heat up and running, you need to have a cloud deployed already. So that's one of the reasons why we start with the pre-built seed VM. It's so that we've got an environment where heat's up and running already so that we can then deploy the other environments. And then, as I said earlier, we use many of the other standard OpenStack tools as well. Um, Keystone, Neutron, Nova Network, Glance, Swift, somewhere. Um, another major tool that we're building, um, most of the work for this tool is being done by Red Hat. Tuscar is to provide a user interface um, to, to Triple O. So Tuscar has a web UI which functions as a Horizon plugin. Um, there's a CLI for people who prefer to type things. Um, and there's an API for people who like you know, doing things over REST. As well as providing UI, Tuscar is pulling in lots of the logic that we've currently got in some of our you know, glue scripts. And they're you know, bundling that into a nice format. Um, at the moment, we have, as I said, lots of shell scripts that sit above all the other small tools and drive them all. Over time, that should go away and be replaced by Tuscar. So we'll just have scripts that do API calls to Tuscar to set up the various levels of cloud. But at the moment, the main thing that ties them together is, and it is actually a regex this time, right? Um, Devtest.sh and its subscripts. So these are in the triple O incubator repo um, on git.openstack.org. They're designed to be very modular, so there's devtest.sh is the top level script. When you look into the code, it calls devtest variables to set up the environment. It calls uh, devtest undercloud to build out an undercloud. It calls devtest overcloud to build a workload cloud. The devtest scripts aim to be production ready. Some of the defaults might not be what you want to use in your production cloud, um, but no two production clouds are alike, so we can't help that. It is highly configurable, so you should be able to build out your production instance with just providing some config to get what you need. And we use these ourselves to do our CI and CD environments. So we're pretty, they also form the base of Helion, um, amongst other deployments. So pretty sure they should work for you in production. So that's enough talking. I've convinced you that you want to try out Triple O at some point. You're, love, you're raring to get started. How do you get started with Triple O? Well, it's very easy. It's just like any other open, uh, open source project. You may have to install Tox. We use it a lot. And if you haven't used it before this, you should start by installing that. You may have to install pip. If you haven't been using pip, you should be using pip. Richard's not here. Excellent. Um, the next thing you want to do is 
phone the code from our Git server. Then you'll want to change into the directory and run dev test. So if you check out dev test for the first time, what does it do? It's going to download and install a bunch of dependencies. This is mostly Python dependencies, so it'll be inside virtual environments. Um, it will use Versh to set up, because you don't, probably don't have bare metal machines to use, it will set up what we call bare metal VMs, um, which emulate being bare metal. Uh, it'll build a seed VM, it'll build a deploy cloud and a workload cloud inside those. There is one other thing though. You need to add a flag before it will do anything. If you're the kind of person who thinks it's a good idea to download code from the internet and tell it to trash your machine, go right ahead, have fun. Um, if you prefer to read the manual, you'll find that our scripts have fairly extensive documentation inside them. Um, that documentation is actually Sphinx formatted for the standard Python code generation. So you can actually run docs-e docs and get your own copy of that docs. It's also on docs.openstack.org, but the version that's up there changes a lot, whereas this version on your machine is going to be exactly at the, uh, the checkout that you've got. I'm almost out of time, so I'll just very quickly tell you that if you're going to be doing this, there is some infrastructure you will need. Um, you'll probably want Squid or a proxy server to cache a lot of the downloads that happen because you probably, it saves you a lot of time not having to do them over and over. Um, along the same lines, you probably want AptMirror or RepoSync to cache all the OS packages handy for you. Um, you'll probably want DevPy to cache all the Python packages because constantly calling out to PyPy to download them takes a long time. And you'll need RAM, um, lots of RAM. Our base install sets up one seed VM, one undercloud VM, one overcloud control VM, and two overcloud compute nodes. At two gig of RAM each, that's 10 gig of RAM just for the clouds. And if you're doing this on your desktop, you've probably got Firefox open as well. Yeah. The, we've got a few things we can do to try to cut down on that, but you will need lots of RAM. If you've got multiple machines, um, we, you can also pass in details of those machines and use them as actual bare metal instead. Um, best way to get in touch with me is I'm Chapo on Freenode, and now I'm out of time.